welcome to Inside Kern. I'm your host, Katie Price. Today we're outside Kern Medical Center, the county's only level two trauma center, where victims of trauma and the indigent come to receive medical care. But today we're here for a different reason. KMC is also a place where new life begins, where challenges are presented and overcome. Today you'll meet a very special family that's working to help the most needy in our county. And it all begins here. Amazing things happen inside these walls. These highly skilled doctors and nurses at Kern County's only public hospital, Kern Medical Center, work hard every single day to save lives, perform delicate operations, and bring new life into the world. But some babies born at KMC are too sick to leave. They're the babies born to drug-addicted mothers, those born with cerebral palsy, heart disorders, or other serious ailments. The different types of diseases that we see in medically fragile children coming into foster care vary from shaken baby syndrome all the way to um, diabetes, especially juvenile diabetes. We can see things such as um, asthma, uh, tuberculosis, valley fever with respiratory complications. We may also see gastrointestinal problems such as um, severe diarrhea or vomiting or failure to thrive. In those instances, you may also see a child have a G-tube or a colostomy um, or maybe even um, TPN, which is um, uh, nutrition that comes in through the veins. Sometimes you will see children that also have uh, mobility issues, such as inability to walk or crawl. Those uh, diagnoses may include cerebral palsy, spina bifida, or traumatic um, physical abuse that occurred while they were with their parent. All of these things are symptoms of children um, who have been in, in severe medical neglect or maybe physical abuse. A big percentage of those infants never make it out of these walls. To them, the high-pitched bleep of medical machines, the metal-barred hospital beds, and uniform-clad medical workers are all they ever know of life. They may spend days weeks, or even months in the hospital, never knowing what a real home can be like. And many of these babies die here. But for a few of these babies, which doctors refer to as medically fragile, there is a chance for life outside the fluorescent lights because of some very special adoptive parents who've taken the time to be trained in how to care for these delicate infants. I think that foster parents are just wonderful people overall. Um, those who truly go into foster care to love children and care for them and desire their good are just um, blessings, I feel. Um, there, there are so many children out there who are needy and who are in um, a very bad situation. Um, and I just, I hope that people would consider caring for children and loving them. And those who do have hearts of gold. So I just, I have a high respect for foster parents and I think they're wonderful, wonderful people. Two ordinary Bakersfield residents have opened up their home and their hearts to these medically fragile children in order to provide them with as normal a life as possible. Linda and Tom Arnold deal with the day-to-day -day care of these children. What can be an around-the-clock job, feeding and bathing them, cleaning their tracheotomy tubes, waking up with them late at night, and helping them walk. The Arnolds began as regular foster parents more than 30 years ago. Over the years, they figure at least 100 children and teens have passed through this home. Some staying for a few days, others for years. We gave birth to two children. We have a son who's turning 43 next month, my firstborn, our firstborn. And then we had a daughter. She died when she was 26 from a brain aneurysm. And then over the years, we've taken custody of nine. 
additionally for a total of 11 children. And our youngest, of course, is four and a half. It's only been the past three years that the Arnolds have been caring for children with severe physical and mental handicaps. Right now in our home, we have Corbin, who's six years old, and we have Jared, he's just turning five, and we have Hope, who will be five in October, and then we have a teenager, Samantha, who just graduated high school and is in transition for college. And then myself and my husband. And then we have various kids running in and out a lot. But that's pretty much our family right now. Well, like you said, we'll have kids around here for quite a while, big time. Especially the three. Keeps her busy and she enjoys it. It gets pretty hectic every once in a while, especially when all of the kids come in. <laughs> it gets pretty hectic around here. That front bedroom there was like a hospital. She was getting kids out of UCLA that come from up here. They had all the machines and everything in there. So. Can't complain about it. So it keeps me busy. If it wasn't for these guys, I'd be out here working somewhere. You wanna go play? I love you. Give me a kiss. You give me a kiss? Yeah. I know. Hope was born at 29 weeks, so she was also a preemie. Hope had to spend a longer period of time in the hospital. She has her sight and her hearing. Uh, she is uh, retarded, but at first, they believed that she was profoundly retarded, and uh, she's actually capable of learning. And uh, so now I've noticed that when they write down uh, their notes, uh, the doctors and nurses tend to put severely retarded, which is kind of an upgrade. And so she's learning quite a bit of things, actually. She doesn't speak because she has a trach. We're gonna try that trick one more time because I hear something. I think you saved some down there. We're gonna try one more. See, make sure that's clear. Ah, you just fooled me, didn't you? Cough. Did we do it? Okay. We did it. Now, let's do some medicine. Help you breathe, okay? Now we're gonna do some medicine. Yeah. It'll help you breathe better, huh? She has a G-tube. She cannot swallow. The trach was um, inserted in her throat because uh, she had no ability to keep her airway clear of her saliva and um, the drainage, sinus drainage and that sort of thing. And so that would have complicated her uh, health. She would have suffered uh, pneumonias and that sort of thing. So they put the trach in to alleviate that problem. Um, and the G-tube, obviously she had to have that because she can't swallow. It's from the brain damage she suffered in utero from uh, exposure to drugs. And um, hope uh, we don't know the extent that she's going to be able to uh, learn and function. We constantly work at that to improve it, and so far she is improving. And um, so uh, she, yeah, she's able to to uh, stand up on her own. She could climb on the sofa by herself, in the recliner chair by herself. She loves to be outdoors. Um, we have a pacer for her so that she can actually be upright and walk. Um, that will help strengthen her legs. We are hoping that someday she'll be mobile. Um, she's holding her weight better on her legs all the time. 
So she's, she's doing really good. Hope was exposed to embalming fluid in utero, which resulted in severe brain damage. When she arrived at the Arnold's at the age of six months, she weighed less than 10 pounds. However, she's improving daily. Perhaps her name, Hope, says it all. The Arnold's hope she will continue to progress and thrive in their care. Sister, you're a long ways off. Wow, look at you walk. I can't see very good what I'm doing here, but you're doing pretty good. Wow, you're doing pretty good there. Okay, jump to sister. Ready? Jump to sister. Wow, you did it. When Jared was born, he was born as a micropremi. So he was born at about 23 weeks gestation. And um, he really wasn't expected to live for quite a while. Um, not too much worked real good because he wasn't fully formed yet. He had to have heart surgery right away. And he had to have uh, some abdominal type surgeries as well. Um, <clears throat> he did survive. However, he did suffer a, a very serious brain bleed. And uh, they believed that his brain was pretty much destroyed by that. However, we've been lucky. He has recovered uh, amazingly. Uh, he was on TPN feedings for quite a while Just because fine. his uh, intestines wasn't really <laughs> digesting. And so um, TPN feedings tend to um, damage the liver and prolonged TPM feedings can even destroy the liver. So when Jared first left the hospital, he was very orange in color from uh, liver problems. Uh, he has overcome that also. Um, Jared uh, currently is just um, pretty much left with his cerebral palsy. Um, he seems to be pretty intelligent and we're catching up we're not quite at age appropriate yet, but we're, we're getting there. And um, as far as his mobility, when he was very small, he would drag his body like a little baby seal. Uh, it appeared that he might be paralyzed below the waist. And there really wasn't much expectation for him to become mobile. And so we're really proud of the fact that he's walking and doing it without AIDS. All right, be careful now. There we go. Yeah. And he actually is learning to run and he's really, really trying to learn to jump. And so we're really, really pleased. He's accomplished a lot, and he's overcome a lot. And um, so basically, that's all that's left to, to um, consider now is just extra therapy and uh, encouragement uh, toward uh, overcoming the, the effects of the cerebral palsy. Jared has made great progress. He's now doing things that doctors didn't think would be possible. His biological parents couldn't care for him and turned him over for adoption. <laughs> it was good, huh? <laughs> you like it? Yeah. He just learned to laugh. Yeah. <laughs> Corbin was a shaken baby. Uh, he was injured about at about the age of four months. And uh, he was at UCLA for approximately a month before we got Corbin. And um, he suffered really extensive damage. He was considered in a coma when we brought him home. He was very heavily medicated and sedated. And um, his life expectancy was uh, based at three to five years. He has a G-tube, 
and he's blind and he's a spastic quadriplegia so that means that he has um, no useful movement of his arms and legs there's there's probably not going to be any improvement in his conditions no matter what we do we work with him uh, to make him as happy and as comfortable as he can be and to um, just encourage him to thrive at his best level. Yo, thank you. Yes. Oh, so needs your face. You want to stretch some more? Stretch, stretch, stretch. Oh. Just stretch them sleepies out, huh? Okay. We're wet from head to toe. Woo. You really tinkled last night. Whoa, we we got big old mass. That's okay, huh? Um, he does have recognition. We don't know to what extent, but we know that he he recognizes familiar voices and touches, and he likes kisses and he smiles. And um, so uh, he's already six years old, which is a year past the highest life expectancy. So we feel really good about that. We feel that he has a, a, a really good quality to life um, for him at his level to um, encourage that, um, that lifespan. Yeah. Despite the surgical efforts of doctors, much of Corbin's brain was destroyed due to the cruel shaking. His father went to prison for this crime. Part of what the Arnolds do is not only care for these medically fragile children, but also mentor the natural parents so they can take part in their child's life. When Corbin was about three months old, we found out he was shaken, baby syndrome. He was born in February, goodness, May. He was in the end of May, he went to the hospital. Um, and then he was in that first foster home for a month and then I think Linda got him in July, the end of July. So probably about a whole month and a half that he was in the hospital. But before that, we were taken into the doctors because he was vomiting all the time and um, wouldn't hold his food down and Pedialyte and all that. So we were trying to figure out what was going on and finally the doctor sent us to get CAT scans and then that gave her kind of a clue. And yeah, the next morning actually, we had, or that day that we had CAT scans done on him, we had to go and uh, get, admit him in Memorial Hospital. And the next morning he had seizures and comatose and everything, and it was horrible to see. And they shipped him off to UCLA. They found out that my ex-husband hurt him. He was shaken. And they said it had to have been more than one time, like drastically too, because he had like a hairline fracture in his skull that had already healed up. And me, Working, I, I had the insurance, so I had to work full time. And I think at that time he wasn't working or he was working part time. So I wasn't home much and I was letting him take care of Corbin. And of course you think, think you know, being naive or not, I guess. You learn your lessons, but very bad lessons. I couldn't take care of Corbin by myself. My mom was having, she has problems, or she did have problems before she passed away. And my family situation wasn't good to help so uh, I let her have him. And it was under guardianship. Um, I was cool with that guardianship. Um, I had the whole scary thing about adoption. And about maybe a year after that, I, I forgot how long, but I let, she adopted him. And it was a better thing for both of us because that way there was no ties to the anything. You know, it was just hers and mine. You know, we could deal with him, you know, however we wanted to. No court papers, visitations and all that. And I felt comfortable with Linda. She, you know, she, we both gained each other's trust, basically, for the whole time, six years that we've been together. So that's pretty cool. With the medically fragile, the very severely handicapped, even when the parents, the families, can't maintain those children themselves, they have a great love for those children. And I think that by allowing those people to come to our home and visit their children, to be a part of their lives at least sometimes, to attend medical appointments when it's possible. 
I think that brings them a better sense of peace with their situation. And then if that child dies, I really think it helps them to find closure. Death is something the Arnolds have been forced to learn to cope with. Instead of shielding herself from the pain of loss, Linda Arnold chooses to face it head on. By pouring out her heart and soul to these kids, she stretched her own faith and emotions. She doesn't consider herself special or unique, just someone who's willing to put the needs of others before herself. She says in a world where many strive to live as long as possible, it's just a reality that some of us will die young. That doesn't mean our short lives can't be fulfilling ones. I think that we all are born with uh, a complete set of emotions. I don't think we can all be happy all the time. We can't. Um, we have to. Um, we have to experience the flip side in order to appreciate what we have. I think that we all have a lot of compassion in ourselves, but when you extend yourself, when you extend your compassion, especially to the extent you need to for a dying process, you're really opening the depths of your soul to pain. And a lot of people maybe kind of fear that. And where do I get the compassion? I think it's there inside of me just like it's in every other person. I just chose to open it up and extend it out. I've learned that it's okay to cry. It's okay to grieve. I've learned that death is a part of the life cycle and that it's okay. It might not be something that we want to happen, but that it's okay. And sometimes when the suffering is very great, it's a blessing and it's okay. And you cry and you grieve and it's okay. You just accept that um, it's a part of life. For Linda, this is about more than just caring for kids. It's about letting them speak through her. Over the years of caring for the special babies, <clears throat> I learned that they have, they have things that need to be said to our community. They have words inside them they can't speak. The only way they can be heard is through me. And so I try at every opportunity to project their message for them. They want love, want a home, a family. They want to be cuddled. They look a little different from your typical kid, but they really want the same things. And they need homes. It's hard to spend all of your life in a hospital or a medical facility. And there's so few people in the world that's willing to extend their emotions to incorporate children like this into their homes and into their lives and into their families. And I think somehow I need to try to encourage people to try because I think the rewards would be so great for them. It has been for us. And the, the rewards outweigh, far outweigh, any of the fears or any of the pain. There's no doubt Tom and Linda can't do it alone. Dozens of other medically fragile children never get to experience the warmth and joy of being in a real home with real parents. You know, medically fragile children um, do take a lot of work, but I would say to the foster parent or pre-adoptive parent who's considering adopting a medically fragile child, I would say to them that it is um, the greatest reward 
um, that you will ever see to have a medically fragile child who develops and maybe even comes out of their condition and goes on to lead a successful life. Um, I would encourage that person to truly consider uh, that adoption and to not be discouraged by what they see as challenges because those challenges can turn into triumphs later on in life and it's hard work but it's just as rewarding and even more so with medically fragile children. Linda is proof that an ordinary person with the right desire can be trained to care for these medically fragile children. While relatively few of us go on to medical school to become doctors or nurses, any of us can open up our hearts to give love to children whom otherwise would only know the sterile setting of a hospital as home. Children sustain me. Children feed my soul. And uh, the medically fragile, terminally ill, for whatever reason, they have rewarded me the greatest. And sometimes I think I fear being without my children because I find so much joy. And that maybe is my greatest fear. Currently, the public health nurses and County Department of Human Services are handling 40 cases of children with special health care needs. And there are only seven homes licensed to care for these kids. If you'd like more information on this segment or any other county department, you can go to our website at www.county.kern.ca.us. On behalf of myself and the entire KGov crew, we hope you've enjoyed this look inside Kern.